Ah, uh, geek out. Hey, and welcome to another installment of Catching Up. I'm Sam. I'm Charles. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. So I think the uh, the hundredth <laughs> yes. episode was a little too big for one episode. So we have two hundred episodes. This is episode one hundred B, and you can find out why Chris is now Charles. But first, we've got what I suppose is a crossover between Geek Out, the Science Channel, and Nerdist Industries. That's right. We interviewed um, a, bun- a whole panel of people for the Outrageous Acts of Science program on the Science Channel, which returns on June 22nd on, the, on again, the Science Channel. Um, I got to interview all the, uh, the scientists, uh, Dr. Uh, Deborah Barabishas, Dr. Um, Hakeem uh, Olusei, and uh, Dr. Adam Rubin, and the editor of uh, Nerdist Science, uh, Kyle Hill. Uh, they're all great. Uh, full disclosure, I've never been that great at uh, I've never been that great at science, like in school. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested in it. And so it was really cool. I think this is what makes this particular interview series because we they're all separate interviews that you're about to hear about ten minutes of pop. And uh, what's cool about it is this isn't pe- two parties that are very familiar about science talking about science. It's one person because I'm out of my depth with this one. I get corrected a lot. And because they they, they legitimately you're going to hear what is dark matter? How would a warp drive theoretically work? How how does um, physics affect data mining or how do you apply physics to data mining? How does malaria medication work? What's the coolest pinball stuff? Can Can Wolverine get a tattoo? Can Wolverine get a tattoo? What happens when you cut off Deadpool's head? Does it regenerate two Deadpools? What can Daenerys Targaryen get a suntan? All of those questions are addressed here. So I think this is really fascinating. Um, yeah, it's some of the it's I, I think some of the most fascinating stuff we've ever done. Uh, a nice little break from the pop culture, though, of course, with those kind of questions that we just hinted at. Pop culture of, will always inevitably creep in. So without much further ado, thank you to the Science Channel. Thank you to the Outrageous Acts of Science program back on uh, June twenty second, and thank you to uh, Kyle Hill and uh, Nerdist Science. This is that interview. Dr. Olushe, thank you for joining us. And thank you for pronouncing my name so well. I aim to please. Thank you. So your, uh, your primary field of research is in astrophysics and that yes. sort of thing. I have a big question because I feel like the big buzz term in astrophysics this, these days is dark matter. Now, dark matter, com- please educate someone that's completely uneducated in this realm. Uh, is, it like, is dark matter like cytoplasm within a cell, but just on a universal scale? Uh, well, if I had a biology friend here to tell me more about cytoplasm in a sca- cell, <laughs> I could answer your question. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't get your question. All right, sure. <laughs> so, in the empty space of of the universe, yes, is it fi- everything that isn't proper matter, like I suppose proto matter, yeah. is that is that dark matter? No, it's not like that. Okay, so uh, dark matter clumps together under gravity as normal matter does, and it has what we call positive gravity. So it, it, it attracts things to itself, but it doesn't pack as tightly as normal matter does. Mm-hmm. So normal matter make really tiny things gravitationally like stars and planets, right? Dark matter doesn't pack that tightly. It makes these huge concentrations. And so the, the interesting thing is that in the very early stages of the universe, the dark matter clustered together gravitationally first. So they saw the dark matter created the, the, the scaffolding around which the normal matter would later fall into the gravitational potential wells. So it sort of told the normal matter where to go in the universe. So it was kind of, uh, there's a, was, I think I read a theory that it also fueled, potentially fueled the Big Bang, the, the presence of dark matter, I or was never, that more antimatter? Uh, well, so the idea is that if you, if you look at the, um, uh, when, when, the, when the idea of the Big Bang first came around, Right, there were a couple of observations that were trying to be explained, and uh, one of them had to do with the abundances of the elements that we see. Why is it everywhere we look in the universe, we see about 75% hydrogen, 25% helium, roughly, right? Sure. And uh, so these places in the universe are, are, are far spread apart from each other, so how could that possibly be? Hmm. Um, and so the answer that they came up with was that, well, look, you know, we know how stars turn hydrogen into helium. What if everywhere in the universe it was as hot as the center of a star and it turned hydrogen into helium, hmm. right? But the question you'd ask is, well, why didn't all the hydrogen turn into helium? So the answer is, is that if you add light, right, as the, as the hydrogen tried to combine the helium, the light would break it up. 
if you add more light, you get less helium. You, you have no light, you get all helium. And so it turned out that the magic number of a billion photons to every proton, you get what we see. So at that moment, we had a prediction uh, of the Big Bang model. There should be this light, it should exist. Today we call that light the cosmic microwave background radiation. But how did that light come into existence? Right. So the idea is, is that you know we know how to make matter and antimatter. It comes in pairs right out of the vacuum of space. So if space expands very rapidly, you get, there's all these virtual particles of matter, antimatter that are all around us. Mm -hmm. And so if they get ripped apart and they can't annihilate, then they must become real particles in our space. So you end up with the universe full of matter and antimatter, right? And so now, if for every billion antimatter particles you have, you have a billion plus one matter particles, the billion annihilates the billion, and you end up with a billion photons and one proton, what we observe in the universe today. So that's how antimatter plays a huge role in the evolution of the universe at the very beginning of time. But dark matter, you know, it, it plays a role later. Sure. Yeah. Uh, does it fuel the expansion of the universe, or is it no. the same property so, kind of so goes there? So the expansion there? of the universe is believed to be just leftover residual energy from the initial event. It's like you throw a ball, and then once you, it leaves your hand, it just... It, it's an inertial expansion. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Four minutes, all right. Um, I should, probably shouldn't have said that. We can cut that on post. <laughs> the, um, the beauty of editing. Of course. The, uh, now, in terms of the... You, you've been working on a space-based uh, telescope that would observe supernova and, uh, and dark matter. Has there been any progress with that lately? Well, yeah. So, you know, this is, a, this is a political process. So this telescope was known as SNAP, the Supernova Acceleration Probe. And so what's happened is that now that has evolved into what's called W first. Um, and so it's a, it's a bigger community effort. And I no longer work directly on W first. I've started working on two other observatories. So there's a ground based observatory called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that's also going to discover lots of supernovae. And so I, I did the earliest study on its capabilities and what's needed in the technologies um, in order for it to do its science best. And now I'm doing the same thing for a space based telescope called TESS which is like Kepler. Um, Kepler discovered all these exoplanets, but they're so far away, we can never measure their, um, <coughs> their atmospheres to the degree of detail we wish. So TESS is designed to find all the planets around all the nearby stars, mm -hmm. so that not only can we measure their atmospheres, that we could potentially even go there someday. Uh, there, there was something that very intrigued me. I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of the J.J. Abrams Star Treks, but in the 2009 J.J. Abrams Star Trek, Scotty kind of makes this breakthrough where he realizes that it's space that's moving, not the actual, uh, I guess, Starship Enterprise. Is that to kind of harp on my uh, apparent lack of knowledge on dark matter or just matter in general, perhaps, or antimatter? The, um, I was wondering how, how propulsion through space would work. In, yeah, in so that that's sense. an idea. So warp drive is not propulsion through space. It's like, suppose I'm in a, a room and there's a carpet. You know, I can travel across the carpet. That's like going through space to get to the other side. That takes some time. But what if I warp the carpet? If I just bring it all and bunch it up right here so that the carpet that was at the other side of the room is now right at my feet, and I just step over the warp. Essentially right? into folds. Yeah, into folds, exactly. So that's kind of how warp drive works. Um, but the idea of space being something that it warps, it, it, it uh, expands, it contracts, like that's real physics. Like that really happens. And the observation of gravitational waves is... Well, the, the sun and, and black holes, they affect both gravity, time, and, and light. And so do you. Oh, well. That's right. You're, well, thank you're warping you. space. That's the, that's, the, that's the crazy thing about space is that it's so sensitive. It can curve under the influence of something that is, you know, has very little mass, like an electron, but yet it's so strong, it can support a black hole. But if you wanted to make, but the thing about it is, is that it's really stiff to waves. So if you want to make it make gravitational waves that we can detect, you got to like slam two black holes together or something like that to make it ring. Mm. Um, well, Doctor, there's something that we ask everybody that comes on our, our program, what to kind of completely change gears now yeah. for something completely <laughs> different. What are you currently geeking out over, be it science, pop culture, anything? Oh, man. Uh, that's a, that, what am I currently geeking out over? Man, I'm always geeking out over something. Um, so, huh. any Any TV shows that you're following? Yeah, no, no. I mean, the Science Channel shows, it, it's sort of like a renaissance on Science Channel sure. right now. Yeah, so I'm really digging the Science Channel shows. 
Um, and and I'm try? thinking musically. Like I've been a musician in in my uh, mm. life, you know, it, off and on. And uh, and so now I'm really thinking about how to combine the two. Oh, I, I suppose if there was somebody in the room that was into uh, sound waves and acoustics, you may be able to work something out. Maybe, but you know, not <laughs> do it so straightforward and linear. Or the physics of sound, or physics, or make a physics rap that sounds like I'm at the LHC and here's where I be. You know, now you know just. <laughs> This is Dram Bowie's quickest lines of descent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, sounds good. Well, Doctor, thanks for coming on the uh, show thanks and explaining uh, yeah. Dark Matter and all that. Awesome. All right. Anytime. Bye bye. And also joining us, we've got Dr. Dr. Berebiches. Thank you for, for coming on the show. Thank you. So, you're, uh, it's interesting because you went to Stanford and you double majored in physics. And philosophy. How did that work out, that kind of com <laughs> combination of natural science and humanities? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I actually majored in both in undergrad, because at Stanford, uh, where I, I did my doctorate, uh, I, I only uh, did physics. But the, the reason is that I grew up in Mexico City, mm. in a conservative community that discouraged girls from pursuing a career in hard science. Mm. And so from a very young age, I was told that I should better pick a more feminine career. And that made me re be really afraid of math and physics. But I was extremely inquisitive, and I kept reading books in my own time, sort of, you know, after school, and, and reading the stories of Tycho Brahe, this Danish astronomer who meticulously found, you know, all these observations across 30 years and, and helped later uh, Kepler come up with the laws of planetary motion. And, and I was so inspired by them, but I always thought, those are weird people. I'm going to be like one of them, completely alone, hated by society, and, and that's it. Yeah, it, it doesn't end well for Galileo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so uh, I enrolled in philosophy in Mexico because I was discouraged so much from, from going to math. And we have the European system where you can only study one subject for four years and not the liberal arts like in the U.S. where you can take courses from different areas. And I was very fortunate to win a scholarship uh, after a couple of years, and I, I transferred to Brandeis University in Massachusetts, and that's when I finished both philosophy and I was able to do physics as well. What was it about, because your, your specialty is within acoustics and, and, yes. uh, and waves, what was it about that field in particular, because uh, physics yeah. is a particularly broad field? Absolutely. You know what it is? The mathematics of doing theoretical physics related to waves is so beautiful. It's aesthetically it's like having a a i don't know an experience that it, it's almost uh, I, I don't want to call it spiritual because i'm not spiritual but it, it, it's 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 an experience of nature that allows you uh, insights and in by using math and manipulating the equations that change the outcome of the experiment so much and in such a beautiful way that i was attracted to it for its aesthetic characteristics you had done work uh, previously with uh, with cell phone waves. I, I was wondering if you could kind of speak about your work on that and may maybe a bit how they work and that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah. So actually, as an undergrad, I did experiments and I worked with liquid crystals and, and with light. I, I was in an optical lab, optics lab, and we basically steered light with this tiny device made up of, of crystals that uh, underwent an electromagnetic uh, effect that made the molecules inside the crystal switch um, uh, size and orientation, and that's how the light got steered, and that was using satellites and very cool stuff. And then I realized that I really liked the mathematics of waves, but I, I didn't enjoy being in a lab so much. And so I became a theoretical physics wh when I was at Stanford, and I did uh, go and, and do some experiments uh, with waves. And what I developed was a technique that allows waves, any kind of waves, acoustic waves, just like sound and music, uh, and electromagnetic waves, which are the ones that we use to communicate with our cell phones, it allows them to focus and, and, be, uh, and target them to a very specific location. Within the broadcast spectrum. Correct. So, so you do need ultra-wide band to achieve that. So right now, the way cell phones work is they, they basically emit a signal and we have cell phone towers all over, let's say, uh, here we're in Washington, and so there's one, you know, every few, every mile or whatnot. And, but the cell phone emits a signal in such a way that's kind of like a cone-shaped, and, and basically anyone who, who would want to interfere or get the signal could simply come up with an antenna and pick that up. 
and it's kind of unsafe, it's an open system and whatnot. And so what we did is we, we thought, how can we uh, m make secure communications happen? And so we built, it's kind of like a laser beam, but without the beam, where it, we did an experiment in the University of Toronto in Canada, and we had uh, one person sending a signal from a cell phone, and three kilometers away at the university, the person with receptors, like basically getting the signal at all these floors, but we only wanted the signal to appear or construct itself in one of the floors. Was that based on quantum computing at all? No. Uh, that, that's an interesting proposition, but all it is, it's, it's called time reversal. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds esoteric, like you're traveling back in time, but you're not. You're really only doing it to the waves. And do you remember, I don't know if when you were a child, uh, you did this where you played a record backwards? Oh, yeah. Right? You get all the <laughs> hidden messages on like Sgt. Pepper, sure. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it, it's basically that time reversal. All it means is reversing the order in which a series of waves arrive at a point. So if I... I emit the sound, which is a wave, hello to you, the first thing you're gonna get is the H-E-L-L-O. Time reversing it only means putting the O in the beginning and the H at the end and sending it back to me, so what I would get is Ole. So that's what you do with waves, of course, in a much more complex way because sure. you get signals and complex messages that people do in their cell phones. By doing that, we, we, uh, we call it, you learn the channel, which basically means how physically the environment affects those waves and the path, all the reflections that they go through, the refractions and whatnot with the materials in the room and in on their way to the, the receiver. So the refraction isn't unlike how satellite telecommunications work. It beams up into space and back down towards the receiver? So the pilot experiment, you first have to learn the channel. So it's only from A to B. So one microphone is the source, the other one is the receiver. But that's only to train the, the system. Now the receiver becomes, the, you use transducers, and so basically the receiver now becomes the microphone. But it now knows the channel, meaning it knows how each wave got affected on its way there. So all you do is you encode messages on it, and because of the, the mathematics, which is very beautiful, the wave equation is a second order equation, meaning it's squared. And so, as you know, when you square any number being negative or a positive number, you get a positive number. Anything squared is positive. So t, if you reverse t time to minus t being, you know, time going backwards, mm -hmm. you're going to get the same result because it's a second order equation, so you get it to focus back at its original location. I know that sounds kind of uh, esoteric, but really the consequences are, are twofold. One is that you get a, a, a very, very uh, focused uh, wave in a specific point. So imagine if you're at the UN and you wanted to translate the speech that was being given into different languages and without cables and without the signals interfering, at each seat you could listen to that speech in a different language. Or imagine if you wanted to do medical applications like lithotripsy, which is a kidney stone destruction. You could focus it so well, we call it super resolution which means it goes beyond the diffraction limit, which normally tells you how well a picture or sound can focus. So by, by using those advantages, you can get very effective targeted communications. And mm. that's why it's a very cool method. That sounds really cool, <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah. Uh, once I wrap my head around the science a bit, but the, uh, no pun intended, well, actually pun intended, totally. <laughs> but it's, it's not easy because the map is very well figured out, but, you know, the science, you, you kind of have to think of what waves do and what the different wavelengths. Well, to take it back yeah. to its, I guess, mathematical basis, it would just be a balance of equations. The same, X would have the same value on each side. Exactly. Yep. Cool. Now, uh, w again, we, we ask this of everybody that comes on the show, what are you currently geeking out over? <laughs> well, I, I love um, explaining complex uh, scientific phenomena in lay and entertaining uh, ways. And so I actually just did a, a, a podcast or a, and a live Facebook event with the Einstein estate. So they own Einstein's uh, you know, licensing and, and all that. It was Einstein's birthday. And I did a whole show on gravitational waves and the theory of relativity and uh, of general and of special relativity. And I just, I mean, just knowing that we just confirmed gravitational waves is, is like my, my super geek out subject at the moment. Uh, I also work in data science, oh. which is a, a, a more practical application of all these equations that 
people are using to apply it to finance and to uh, retail or healthcare and whatnot. And so sometimes I work with companies looking at their data sets and making models, very much like I did in physics, but making models that explain or gain insights into what's happening. In so it would basically, I mean, I'm trying to think how the, um, how the, the physics would apply to, to data mining and that sort of thing. Would it just be analytics and, and that sort of thing? So, for example, uh, it's not that, that they're the same, but in, in physics, uh, sometimes you, you study, for example, fluid, fluid dynamics, right? And you can make an analogy between that to traffic in a street, you know, cars and how you get bottleneck effect when everybody's like trying to look at what happened in an accident or something. So you make those analogies and you apply the same models and, and you do that there. So people are doing, for example, uh, models of fluids to understand network n networking effects in f on Facebook or any social media. And so viral marketing. Uh, yeah, viral marketing and all that. So you use the same mathematical equations to describe a phenomena, but instead of looking at molecules in a gas, you're actually looking at people in, in an auditorium or... I think there was a book, uh, The Wisdom of Crowds, I yes. think kind of explored that. Yeah, yeah. that was that's uh, all right. Yeah. Is anything in pop culture that you're currently digging on? Oh, that's uh, a good question. Well, <laughs> Civil War is awesome. I mean, that, that was that was cool. <laughs> I, I X Men Apocalypse maybe not as much. Yeah, I I totally I tend to I, I don't read a lot of fiction anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, fiction. I, I tend to I, I am watching a couple of shows that I am really into, like Suits, and but they're not. Uh, very scientific, but <laughs> <laughs> but I love geeking out in science. I love reading. I love participating in conferences and meeting other amazing minds uh, and and mostly inspiring young people. I mean, what makes my my life tick? What my mission in life is when I can ignite a young person's mind and making them believe that their dreams of becoming a scientist, an engineer, or a technologist can become true. Well, I mean, you had mentioned that coming out of Mexico City, there yes. wasn't a lot of, you know, opportunities. Yes. Yeah, so hopefully, you know, you kind of stand as a shining example to your hometown. Yes. Right. Well, definitely try to be one. Thank <laughs> you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, doctor. Thank you so much. Also joining us is Dr. Rubin. The, uh, he holds a PhD in biology. Uh, Dr. Rubin, thanks for joining us. Sure, thanks for having me. So what is it about, I mean, your, your specialty is molecular biology. What was it that really kind of like drew you to that, to that field of study? Um, <laughs> I actually started in molecular biology because I found out that I couldn't cut it as a chemical engineer. Oh. So I, I, uh, I majored, in, majored in chemical engineering when I first went to school, and that's because I was told that engineering means problem solving, and I thought that's what I like to do. So I majored in chemical engineering without even knowing that chemical engineers design like chemical factories. I have no interest in designing chemical factories, and I found out not only was it hard, but it was not anything that felt valuable to me, and, uh, and so it's sort of a double whammy. So after a year and a half of that, I said, all right, I should do something else. I still like science. I still like the natural world. Um, and I had my choice of either regular biology or molecular biology, and I felt like enough of a failure dropping out of chemical engineering that I went to molecular biology because it sounded harder. Yeah. And more uh, syllables. I mean, yeah. More syllables in it. Yeah. It sounds when people say, "What are you doing?" Oh, I'm a molecular biologist. Like, whoa! Well, hold it. Don't go whoa. I didn't say I was good at it. It's just, <laughs> just the name of what I do. Um, yeah, that's that's how I that's how I got into it. And then my first molecular biology class in college, um, they're talking about all kinds of things you could do, editing DNA and using restriction enzymes and all this stuff, and I, I didn't know about any of that stuff. Sounds uh, like Jurassic Park. Pretty much, yeah. except, except that, this is things that these are things people actually do and do on a daily basis. Right. Um, and, and I thought, okay, this, this actually is really cool. I never knew about it. I'm, I'm a this major now, so good news. I'll stay with this. What was most of your doctoral work within molecular biology then? So I was working in a lab um, on new drugs for malaria, there's a, a target in the malaria parasite. It's a, a aspartic protease or a family of aspartic proteases. They're these little proteins that chew up other proteins. And if you can block them with a drug, then they won't chew up other proteins. The one they like to chew up the most is your hemoglobin. So good idea to block them. Uh, so a drug like that would be pretty similar to some HIV drugs. Because it's a, that's right. Malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. It's a bloodborne parasite, isn't it? Um, for part of its life cycle, yeah. So basically, the malaria parasite spends uh, part of its life cycle in the mosquito's gut, then it migrates to the mosquito's salivary glands, and when a mosquito takes a blood meal, some of that saliva ends up in your blood. 
If that mosquito is infected, some of the parasites make their way into you. They're called sporozoites at this point, and the sporozoites invade your blood, uh, ride that all the way to your liver, invade your liver cells, and then they grow and divide, and then burst out and back into your blood in a new stage. So when you have a malaria infection, when you are sick with malaria, it's because the parasites have already gone from the mosquito into you, into your liver, and then come out, and then it's like a week, week and a half later. Yeah, I, re I did a study abroad in Costa Rica while I was in college, and I remember having to take malaria medication, and I, I, I got the weirdest dreams, but that, I digress. Anyway, yeah, there's something about, uh, there's a, like a psychotropic quality to at least ma malaria medication at the it, time. It depends on, some, on the malaria medication. I think uh, one of them has gotten a, a bad rap for that, but um, I was actually just talking to the CEO of the company where I work now the other day, and we're also working on malaria, and he said, that's crazy, I've taken that a million times, I've never had scary dreams. Um, I really don't know. <laughs> lucky, lucky fella. <laughs> so in addition to your work as a scientist, you're also a published author. You've uh, published a book, perhaps tellingly on your college years, <laughs> or more, more accurately, your, college years. your doctoral work, yeah. yes, um, surviving your stupid, stupid decision to go to grad school. Yep. In addition, uh, and you've also written a book on, I believe, pinball? Um, I've written a draft of a book on pinball, so that that book is going to come out next year, okay. provided that I finish it. Sure. Um, I actually turned the draft in like a couple days ago, um, and then I've got the next two months to edit it down and things like that. But yeah, um, I one of my other obsessions is pinball. I've always loved pinball, and I've is that your favorite Who song? I I just have to ask for contractual reasons. Of based on all the other Who's, actually, it's not even the best Who song. <laughs> Uh, you know, I've found from, from doing this research for the book that there are, there's more than just Pinball Wizard when it comes to pinball songs. There's actually a song from the 50s called Pinball Boogie. Oh. People were writing about pinball all the time in the 50s and 60s. It was, it was nuts. And some of these songs are, none of them are that great. <laughs> but, but they're about pinball, which is cool. I, there was a uh, pinball cabinet at a dive bar I used to go to where it was a Dirty hairy themed pinball cabinet. Mm -hmm. And to shoot the ball you would pull the trigger on the 44 Magnum, and it was just like, make my day every time. But yep. what was it about? Uh, why, why did you want to go out to become an author? Um, so I've, I've always been, been uh, writing things. I've, um, in college, I, was a, I wanted to double major. They didn't offer double majors as a possibility, so I minored in creative writing. Um, so I felt really, really great doing that. It was a lot of fun. I would go do my chemical engineering or molecular biology stuff, and then I'd go into this building which, which is just full of poets and uh, and fiction writers and things like that, and just enter a completely different mindset. Was it kind of like almost like a, a nice palate cleanser from the heavy science? Very much, yeah, yeah. I would have, you know, I'd be up until 3 in the morning doing a problem set for, for linear algebra or something, and then I'd go and just sit with people who'd read these poems, and we'd talk about poems. It's just a completely, yeah, completely different realm. Um, so I've always written things. I've always liked writing things. Um, the grad school book was sort of a response to what it was like being in grad school, all the problems with grad school. All that angst just channeled so in the So much text. angst. Oh yeah. my. The, most of the angst coming from the fact that in a PhD program, you don't know when you're getting out. And so uh, I was in my program for seven years. They tell you on the way in that the average is something like five years. I've now spoken at grad schools across the country. Every program tells every student the average is something like five years, maybe six. If you're really good, you can do it in four. It's a lie everywhere. My, my day job is with George Mason University over in Fairfax, and I'm always like, whenever I talk to incoming, you know, uh, recruits i'm always like five to seven years five to seven years but having said that i've seen people that have taken like 11 years like it happens right and that means yeah. that for the for those last for year eight year nine year 10 year 11 you don't know what is going to happen i interviewed for a job when i was in my fifth year and they said so when do you think um, you might be able to work here if we were interested in hiring you and i said well uh, i'm in my fifth year now so probably just a couple months and they said oh so you don't have a graduation date well no but i'm in my fifth year they said all right well let us know when you have a graduation date. I'm like, okay, I'll email you in a month or so. And then I was in school for two more years. You can't plan anything. You can't do anything. Your, your life is stagnant for that last part of time. So that's why I wrote that book. Was, it, was a lot of it kind of written after the fact, or was it kind of like you're sitting there in that last year of <laughs> doctoral work, you're about to face the battery of exams, you're about to like turn in your doctoral thesis, and you're just like, I need to get this off my chest. No, most was, most was written afterwards, just afterwards. I would not have had time to write it during. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> that is absolutely fair. Um, now, something that we ask everybody, as you may have heard, possibly, what are you currently geeking out over? Besides pinball? 
I mean, it can totally be. Mm. What's your favorite cabinet? Oh, definitely pin- my favorite pinball is cabinet? Rocky Three. Because Rocky Three. Yeah, it's, you got Mr. T and you've got you've got Hulk Hogan. Oh my goodness! I'm sorry. Uh, never heard that one cited. <laughs> yeah. is, is there a Rocky Three pinball? There's machine? like an every Rocky pin. Maybe not. Balboa. No, I think probably not five either. Now that I think about it, I don't think so. Well, there's, there, well, there's um, your Dirty Harry does exist. I do know that one. Yeah, my favorite is probably something like uh, Twilight Zone. Uh, 1993, designed by Pat Lawler, who I got to meet a few months ago. The amazing thing is all the people who designed the greatest pinball machines, they're still around, and yeah. a lot of them are designing pinball machines again or still. Yeah, there's almost like a resurgence or something coming around. It's a huge resurgence. There was, so not to get too de- deep into pinball. Oh, but you can in, go as deep as you want, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. In, um, in the 30s, there were 145 different companies making pinball machines, 145 companies. By the end of the 90s, it was down to three. In uh, on October twenty fifth, ninety nine, when Win- Williams closed their doors, uh, it was down to one. Mm. Then in two thousand eight, that one almost became zero. So is there is one pinball manufacturer for nineteen ninety nine until pretty much two thousand thirteen, and now there are five. Just in the past couple of years, all these other smaller manufacturers, you know, people that aren't making ten thousand games, but they're making a few hundred, but legitimately making and selling games. Um, some of my favorite games are ones made by uh, this this new manufacturer, Jersey Jack. He's made a Wizard of Oz machine that has a 27-inch screen in the back box, something that nobody would have ever tried before. Um, it's it's amazing what's going on with pinball now. As a slight aside, I made a mistake. The beginning of Rocky Three has a Rocky pinball machine. There isn't a Rocky Three pinball cabinet, as far as I know. I see, I yeah, see. Yeah, that's and where the... If, but if you wanted to learn more about that, there's a guy who calls himself Pin Geek who has a, an extremely detailed web page of every time a pinball machine has ever appeared in a movie or television show. Like hundreds of listings. I'm sure that's in there. Pro- I mean, that's like the second highest grossing Rocky movie. So. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, for example. I, yeah. But I, I would hope that there would be some sort of resurgence for because as a kid of the late 80s and early 90s, I, I would hope that they're because i remember arcades being a thing yeah and they're not a thing anymore they're not a thing but they're a, they're a sliver of a thing there are now a, a brand new pinball bar just opened up in bethesda just a, a month ago it's pinball and pizza that's all they have pinball pizza and soft serve ice cream zach we need to make a play date you need to go it's it's called um it's called vuk v-u-k which stands for vertical up kicker which is a part of a pinball machine yeah. um it's they've got 10 pinball machines and food these places are now coming back online. There are 20 different pinball machines in the uh, sorry pinball museums in the world. That's just museums. There are arcades. There's um, uh, there are barcades, beer arcades. You know every kind of retro thing that people have, and and a lot of uh, a lot of new stuff too. Kind of the niche industry becoming becoming a little bit more mainstream than it used to. Kind of slowly, but in a very organic way. Wow. Oh. There you have it. Hopefully, maybe one of these days we can get uh, we can get time out back at Springfield Mall. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that'd be nice. I've heard that there's a Ghostbusters pinball machine in the basement right now of uh, Awesome Con. So I am. That's one of the. That's the newest one made by Stern. Uh, I'm going to be going there at some point. Okay. Well, I think we all know what we're we're going to take a bit of a field trip after this one. Oh yes. But, uh, Doctor, thanks for coming on. And, yeah. And, thank uh, you very much. Signs. Thanks. And also joining us, we've got Kyle Hill. He's a science writer. He's written for Wired. He's uh, the current uh, editor for Nerdist Science yeah. through uh, Nerdist Industries. And you've got a new show coming out on the Science Channel called yeah. How to Build Everything. Yeah, so uh, I'm just a, I'm, I'm one of the cogs in this many-wheeled machine uh, known as How to Build Everything. And it's, it's kind of like a cross between uh, how it's made and outrageous acts of science, which are both on the Science Channel. And it's, it's me and comedians and astronauts and scientists and engineers explaining how to <laughs> literally build everything from the ground up. Uh, it's, it's a mixture of fun and seriousness that uh, Science Channel is really honing in on these days, and uh, it premieres an hour after the new uh, episode of our Rage of Science, and it should be a lot of fun. Is it so? Is it more kind of in the, within the when you everything is probably as broad as you can possibly get as a term. So is it mostly like say engineering? Is there going to be like some sort of genetics? It depends, man. If you if you want to know how to milk a cow with a machine, oh, we got that. Want to know how to build a yacht? How to build a water slide that's 150 feet tall? Um, how to build something that eats cars for breakfast? <laughs> oh yeah, it's lunch all, and it, dinner. It's all lunch and. And maybe even a little bit of brunch. Yeah, fourth meal. Maserati if we're go. for brunch. Yeah. <laughs> going Italian then. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> unlimited soup and salad and Maseratis. Sure, breadsticks on the side. So what 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 first got you into science? I mean, I've always been a geek. I've always and I've always been very supported by my parents, um, taking me to museums and and letting me be creative and you know just letting me sit in a room with a pile of Legos for three hours without disturbing me, um, which is kind of how I live my life now. But um, I've uh, I went through school having watched great science shows like Bill Nye the Science Guy, like Milf, Myth, <laughs> Milf Busters. <laughs> like <laughs> I thought that was the Real Housewives yeah, yeah. of New York. Like, uh, like Myth Busters, and uh, that kind of experience drove me towards engineering school. And then while I was in engineering school, I decided that I liked talking about science actu- more than actually doing it. So I went into communications after that. And then, as you mentioned, I started writing for myself professionally, and um, thankfully, I was getting on people's radar enough that I started doing some TV work. Uh, I met my boss, Chris Hardwick, at a party. I asked him, I, t- I told him, I bet I can tell you how the Walking Dead virus works or not. And he said, you should talk to my people. And I did. And two weeks later, I drove out with a cat, two cats and a U-Haul from Wisconsin. And here I am. I remember Chris has kind of got a big background in computer science. I think he's got still might have a working Commodore 64. And I, I'm, but- I, I think that Chris is actually a robot oh yeah 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 I, I don't know how you can host like three shows do three podcasts a week and have the pre- mm, yeah chris if you're a robot please spare me that's that's how they do all the the xfinity ads with him really <laughs> he's more more machine than man now he's more nerdist than man now so how did the uh, how did the uh, how to build everything uh, program kind of come about? Was that something that you would pitch to uh, science? Uh? No, no, no. So uh, this was already a show, and uh, sometimes uh, with these kinds of shows, like a, a Talking Head style show, where you show clips, uh, CGI or live action stuff, then you have people experts talk over them. Um, you have the show, and then they contact outside experts and personalities to come in and film a little bit, and then they cut that up into a couple of different episodes. And so I was brought in. As uh, with an engineering background to talk about um, stuff like car crushers and building large structures and stuff like that. Oh, sounds yeah. cool. Now, uh, Kyle, what are you currently geeking out over? Um, I'm trying to figure out as realistically as I can what would happen if you, if you decapitated Deadpool, would two Deadpools grow back? Would his head regrow a body or would his body regrow a head? Well, the, that's an interesting question. That I know you canonically posit. what happens in the comics. Canonically. But that's you, not what I'm concerned about. Well, would the regeneration matrix be able to support the, bra- the complex brave waves of a second Deadpool? Well, it's not, it's, not just, it's not just that, right? I mean, there's limiting factors uh, for any regenerative capability. So uh, something like an axolotl which is a, a Mexican cave salamander that's unfortunately extinct in the wild now. It only lives in labs. It can regenerate unlike any animal we've ever seen in the world. You can cut off any of its limbs any number of times at any place on the limb, and it will grow back indefinitely without scarring forever. You can take out one of its eyes. Its eyes will grow back. You can sever its spinal cord. Its spinal cord will reattach. It is an amazing, amazing animal. So if Deadpool is close to something like that, and I think it is, because if you had cancer like Deadpool does and have a regeneration factor, then your body would need some kind of control over cell multiplication and uh, division and then also having the hormones to tamp down that division so you don't get something like a tumor. And that's what we think the salamander is doing. So using the salamander as a reference, there has to be some point at which it cannot regenerate from. So there's these limiting factors, time, resources, immunity scarcity, those, those kind of things. So if you were to cut off a salamander's head, it may have the ability to regenerate, but it's going to be dead before it can do so because it takes a long time to regrow a body. It takes them about a month to regrow a hand, so you'd be dead before that happened. A large gaping wound is also a big immunity problem, so you might get an infection and die from that. Third is resources. If you're just a head, where are all those cells coming from to rebuild a body from? Well, if we're going by the movie's logic, it took them approximately... Six hours to generate enough mass to rebuild a hand? That's just a hand. You have, uh, what happens in the salamanders is that the cells at the base of the wound go back into a neonatal state, stem cells, if you will, and then regrow a limb as if it was developing as an embryo. But those cells in that, and, and those resources have to come from somewhere. A head does not have enough resources for a full body. So, what would happen? Deadpool would probably die. But there has to be some angle or portion or fraction that you could cut Deadpool at 
that a lot of them would grow back. I think you could cut pretty much 60% of them on this side, leave the heart, and the other half would grow back. That's what I'm going for. That sounds about. That's a future episode <laughs> because science. <laughs> how to build Deadpool? I'm I'm I I was writing it on the plane. <laughs> that and how to des- can Daenerys Targaryen get a sunburn? Well, huh, that- right? No, no, I know, right? I love those questions like that. Like, can Wolverine get a tattoo? I just did that one. It's fascinating. Well, w- Wolverine uh, tattoos are essentially scarring, aren't they? So wouldn't no, they? No, no, no. I I was unaware of how. Tattoos actually worked. I thought apparently it's me too. <laughs> I thought the tattoo gun just injected ink underneath your skin, and that was that. Um, that's not the case. What uh, a machine, what a tattoo machine does is it creates hundreds of tiny holes on your skin, and then capillary action, the same kind of stuff that draws water up into a paper towel, draws metallic ink down into your skin, and that disperses itself among metallic particles, disperses itself underneath the skin, and that's what creates a tattoo. So. What is a regeneration factor? If it's just regenerating cells, that's not what fades a tattoo. That's not what gets rid of a tattoo. It's your white blood cells attacking the metal particles and trying to remove them. The only way that we know how to do this effectively right now is laser removal, and that's because with pulses of heat and light, it breaks apart these metal particles so that the white blood cells can get around them enough, they're, they're too big in the first place, to get them and take them uh, to your liver and then uh, to your colon, and then you poop out a tattoo. Oh. Yeah. Well, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what happens when you get laser tattoo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you poop out a tattoo. So by that rationale, would Hugh Jackman or Wolverine more accurately be able to? I think you could get a permanent tattoo because the kinds of regeneration that we see him use is not necessarily the same method. It, it's not necessarily white blood cell based. Hmm. You know, regrowing a limb is different than fighting an infection. And to answer your final question, Daenerys would she would technically be able to get a sunburn because it, she's Why? well isn't she on she's invulnerable to fire correct well if we go by the tv show yes. the tv show implies that she's invulnerable to fire but tan isn't a tan a result of ultraviolet radiation yeah and so what is fire it's not. This isn't a trick question. I spent like three hours at work thinking about why fire is hot and it was very confusing to me <laughs> what what about a fire burns you it's a deceptively simple question. Now, deceptively hard, simple question. And that's why I love tackling pop culture and scientific elements like that because it sounds silly or meaningless on its, on its front, but then when you dig deeper, you're like, oh, man, I'm learning about the fundamentals of the universe. I, this has been, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, yeah. I, Stay tuned, man. Yeah. i to figure it out, <laughs> probably. Well... well. Let's look forward to uh, to how to build everything. When when do you uh, when do you start uh, hosting the uh, the gig? So uh, again, I'm just I'm featured on it, uh, and it's going to be premiering after Outrageous Acts of Science on June 22nd at 10 p.m. So DVR that. Yeah, and if you want to find my stuff like the stuff we were talking about, uh, you can go to the YouTube uh, channel for Nerdist, and my show is called Because Science. And there you have it. Yeah. All right, Kyle. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Cool. Yeah, I mean, again, it, that was very informative. Like, I apparently found out that uh, dark matter did not, you know, fuel the Big Bang or, uh, you know. I can't believe you didn't know that. Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take away that Dr. Sam Stone. I didn't, know, I didn't know that fire emits ultraviolet radiation. Uh-huh. Um, but you find that out. But we did know that salt is salty. Yes, mm. it is still sodium chloride. It is still NaCl. Yeah. But the... Uh, yeah, so th- thanks again, you know, for Awesome Con for making that an opportunity and for the, you know, the Science Channel and tell, you know, all those scientists. That was that was legitimately like just a lot of fun. And I I, I feel like you guys had as much fun as 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 uh, Zach and I. So uh so yeah, thanks thanks again. And definitely check out that program on on uh, June 22nd, Outrageous Acts of Science. And thanks uh to Zach for helping out with Yeah, uh, stepping up, man. Cuz I was I ended up being busy pretty much the entire time that we were doing interviews. So uh, having that helping hand uh, run the uh, the recorder and everything that was that was nice. Yeah, and it was cool because he was cosplaying as Iron Man, and they were all like, "Oh, it's a uh, it's because he had the uh, half the Iron Man mm-hmm. repulsor arm." And oh, nice! Just like yeah, oh, a little cool. tap light on his chest. Yeah, which I think they noticed was off center. But anyway, <laughs> he uh, and he was a facial hair bro. He so, was uh, an awesome facial hair yeah. bro. <laughs> Scientists gotta love Tony Stark, right? Yeah, but yeah. Um, so let's talk about Awesome Con. You know, in general, you know, that's our big DC con. Um, and of course, as we alluded to, Chris is now Charles in, the, Charles? in the eyes of the. Oh my God. I am Charles. The uh, best so, thing of all time. Yeah. So um, I'll go into the to the to the story. So <laughs> I, um, uh, the big guest 
this year at at Awesome Con was Adam West and Burt Ward. They were together, uh, reunited, and it feels so good. I mean, I was going to refrain because I didn't want to make it sound like they had they had been apart for years and years. But yes, it was a good it was a good song. Uh, but yeah, they were they were, they were back at it again uh, together. Uh, and you could get a VIP pass that uh, awarded you a, an autograph with both of them and a uh, photograph uh, with you know uh, with with the two of them as well. So uh, I chose to do that one because I was like, oh, I love you know Batman sixty six, and like I'm going to be totally honest, they're both starting to get up there in years. So I don't know how many more cons they have left. So this one you know kind of fell in my lap. I was like, yes, gonna do it, gonna you know gonna get their autographs and everything. So naturally, I have Batman sixty six on Laserdisc as I am the Laser Dick. Uh, so I bring that with me to Awesome Con. I have my VIP badge. I have my little voucher that says I get you know autographs with both of them. I take that up to their booth. Their handler, uh, their civilian, whatever you want to call them, uh, is like, "Cool, which picture would you like signed?" You know, yeah. They, naturally, they have a table full of little mini prints and stuff like that that you can you know pick you know and be like i want that one signed and i was like oh no no i got my own thing and uh, so right off the bat much to my chagrin 20 extra bucks first time i've ever run into this where you have to pay extra if you bring your own thing and that that's just a minor uh at this point i'm like fuck it you know this is my thing here's 20 bucks all right and he's like cool what's your name Chris, C H R I S. He's like awesome. He leans over to Adam West, hands him my laser disc, and he's like C H R I S. Adam West is like, got it. Start signing. And we're making idle chit chat, you know, like, oh hey, cool, laser disc, blah blah blah, you know, awesome con. Yeah, it's really fun. Finishes it, hands it back to me, and goes to shake my hand. He's like, enjoy the rest of your con, Charles. And I was like, huh? And I look down at my laser disc, and it says to Charles, Adam West. And I'm like, fuck. <laughs> and it's in it's in Sharpie. There's nothing I can do. So I'm like, all right, thanks. And I just walk away because, like, what am I gonna do? I'm yeah. you know, gonna raise a big stink and be like, hey, fuck you. You know, thanks for coming to the convention and signing my thing. And but Become you misspelled Batman's my name. Latest villain. Yeah, right. You know uh, the Charles. Yeah, <laughs> the Chuck. I was yeah. Chris. Now I am, I am Charles. Charles in charge. <laughs> but yeah, so like, <laughs> so I was just sitting there like, the fuck, you know, <laughs> the only the only celebrity at this convention that didn't have like the stack of post its that you just wrote your name on. Yeah, seriously. Uh, and to and, and, and you know stuck it to the thing that you were getting signed, so they made sure they spelled it right, and he misspells my name. So, I go over to the Burt Ward line, because they're not in the same line. They're two separate things. Go over to the Burt Ward line, hand my laser disc to to the handler. Again, another $20. And I'm like, Jesus. All right, fine. I'm already halfway there. Might as well just finish the, the cycle. Hand the laser disc to him. Doesn't even ask my name. Hands it to Burt Ward. Burt Ward also does not ask my name. Because it's written clear as day on my laser disc. <laughs> so he, name is Charles. Charles. <laughs> so he signs it. He signs it. Zap! Charles. Burt Ward. And then lets me know that he's Robin. Which, that's fine. That's that, that, I, I say it condescendingly, but I... That, Wait, that's he fine. told I, you he's no, Robin? No, no, He wrote it. Oh, okay. Like, By the quotes. way, I'm Robin. He'd be like, I know. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm here. Yeah. But yeah, so I am... Seriously, how could anyone forget your Robin? Yeah. My my favorite thing is though Unlike like Chris's name. <laughs> yeah. Uh my dad and I happened to be walking over there and we didn't know Chris, you know, we knew we'd meet up with Chris and Sam eventually, but we happened to walk over to that area where the the autograph tables were right as Chris was coming out of the Burt Ward line <laughs> and he was looking like he had just been smacked in the face multiple times by a giant fish. Well, and he looked so twice. fucking confused, dude. And I remember I was like, Chris, and he didn't respond because he's probably thinking, am I Charles? Uh, <laughs> I, was you having, know? I was having a, a, a crisis, a, an infinite Chris on Charles crisis, <laughs> <laughs> identity crisis. Dr. Light's the bad guy. Oh, yeah. That's right. yeah. And uh, what, a, what a book. But um, yeah. And so we we're like, Chris, Chris, you walk over and he go, <laughs> he just looks up and he goes, apparently I'm Charles. And I just see to Charles and I'm like, what the fuck? And he tells me the whole story. My dad and I are cracking up because um, we, we were going to try to see, um, you know, my, my thing was to, to see Carl Urban. Ray Park and David Prowse. Ray Park had no line because he wasn't there. I guess he was doing a panel. Same with David Prowse. 
And so I saw the Carl Urban line, and, and, and Chris and I were just kind of talking. He was filming in on you know what he did Friday because I just my dad and I just got Saturday passes, just worked best for us for, for the day, and, and and that was kind of a Father Day Father's Day present to him to kind of spend a full day at a con. Him being you know a uh, a, a young at heart well, uh, got, comic fan, his uh, youthful appearance got a complimented yeah, by Mark. So Wade. it's funny because you know my dad's very you know we're gonna leave it this time, we're gonna get here this time, and. And blah blah blah, but so he was very in his element getting there. You know, dr- drove the Pentagon City a little bit out of the, longer, but to get on the metro was not as long of a ride. Yeah, get out of the delays. You know, he knows the area very well. We're in line, ready to go. But as soon as we step inside, he's out of his element because you know he came when I was working at the shop. He came to a Baltimore Comic Con for maybe an hour or two. The first time he'd ever done anything like that. Um, and so you know we were there right at open, and we were there you know for you know. Uh, Two thirty ish, three o'clock, maybe. I, I don't remember the exact time we left, but you know, there for a long time. And so, his only thing he wanted to do was meet Mark Wade, because um, he loves Mark Wade. And so, and who doesn't love Mark Wade? Oh, I mean, Kingdom Come, his yeah. Daredevil run. Yeah, you know the the. How many people did I see where where I am not Daredevil yeah. shirts? You know. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, and I've also really loved um, you know the pulp stuff he does, the Green Hornet and Rocketeer. Yeah. You know, and he's I, currently I, doing awesome work with Black Widow and yeah. Archie. You know, we reviewed. That's right. We got yeah, an yeah. advance review for Archie. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I should have told him about that. Um, but I got, I got him to sign my issue one. Oh, nice. And so, um, the day before, my dad has the first volume of his Daredevil run. Um, Kingdom Come and, and Black Widow number one, uh, which I think he forgot to get signed in the excitement because you know he just had the two things. He's like, oh, and so we're like walking around. Um, they had the, the the car that Tony Stark lands on in the first Iron Man movie, which I had no idea I was going to be there. It's a Shelby, yeah, yeah, really really cool. The suit of armor, they had the shield and everything, and, and a beautiful replica of the '66 Batmobile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just really cool stuff. So we had time to kind of walk around, and we were like, look, we know we're going to buy stuff, but we're not going to do that till later. Let's just scope the area out and kind of plan our day. And my dad's like, all I wanted to see is Mark Wade. That's all I care about. And Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos. Like, he's buying every issue of that ever. And so, um, he, it's funny. He was like, you know, in the back of those issues, it has, like, information about, like, weapons in the military and stuff. He's like, that's how my fucking brother and everybody knew so much of the military when they were younger because they were reading comic books. And so... Um, Different times, man. Yeah, <laughs> right? So, he's like, you know, and then they all joined the military. So... Uh, you know, we kind of scoped out, uh, saw a couple old people uh, that I, that I used to work with, at, uh, and, and, and talked to them, which is really cool. And then um, saw that he was at, you know, I think seven oh seven was his table. You know, he wasn't an artist alley or anything. Well, he had a his table was with uh, oh yeah oh, comics because yeah, he's yeah. a part owner. That's right. And so, uh, like at eleven oh five, yeah, we 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 mosey our way back, and you know, my dad is nobody looks like, and I get to play Sam Stone this time because. <laughs> I know what Mark Wade looks like. I, I still don't know what a lot of you've people... You've met him. You've met him before. Yeah, I met him before. And uh, Sam Stone did the same thing for me. Sam Stone. Sam. <laughs> uh, at Baltimore. Was, was that two years, three years ago? Two it was uh, 2013. So 2013. Yeah, be almost, oh, wow. This, uh, this coming Baltimore Comic Con in September will be the third yeah. anniversary of our first crossing paths with Mr. Mark Mr. Wade. Mark, Mr. Mark Wade. And so I, I saw him and I was like, all right, there he is. Let's go. And so my dad... It's very weird to see him um, like geek out about something, you know? And, um, and so he... I open the backpack and I, you know, he's like, hey, you know, here, get your books. And he just kind of walks over like a little kid and he just puts his book down. He's like, Mr. Wade, Mr. Wade, I'm a big fan. I'm new into comic books. Uh, and he's like, oh, dude. I was like, oh, really? He's like, what, what got you, uh, what got you in the comic books? And he's like, oh, my son here he used to work at a comic shop. We talked about that. And it was cool. He asked, you know, what shop and he knew the shop and everything. And, um, he was like, yeah, I, I probably have more comic books, uh, for, you know, as a new 62-year-old fan than, than I should. And he was, like, signing one of the books. And he looked up, and he's like, you're not 62. And I remember, uh, I was like, wait, did he just say that? And he's like, you're not 62. You look great for 62. I want to be looked that good when I'm 62. And I'm thinking there, I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was kind of amazing. Is it almost as, is it better or, or not, uh, better as good or worse than the Greg off? It, <laughs> it was better. Uh, Hmm. I think I think it was better than the Greg off because I just saw it all go down. Where like the Greg off was something I turned around as it was ending, and it was like, ah. Oh. Um, th- I mean, that was uh, unbelievable. The Greg off is, is the greatest thing of all time. But yeah, the Mark Wade thing was cool because you know, and and Mark Wade is just so nice and wonderful and animated. And even, you know, and I was joking, you know, oh, we were probably the first people we saw. Even if we were the last people he saw, he would have been that animated. And he's I, such you know, a fucking good dude. Yeah, I've I've only crossed paths with Mark Wade like I guess this is the fourth time. Mm-hmm. And he's always just the nicest, most approachable guy. Yeah, and he's asking us, you know, he's asking us questions. Um, you know, I was thinking him about, you know, because I, I brought um, his Green Green Hornet number one, the beautiful Alex Ross cover that he did. 
uh, that Alex Ross did for his his Green Hornet uh, work and, and thanking him for the pulp stuff. And you know, you know, talked a little bit, you know, when he did the Rocketeer Chris Samney, which is so great, the Cargo, Cargo of Doom stuff, and um, you know, just talking to my dad. And my dad was like, "Who would you get to play Black Widow? That's not Scarlett Johansson." And they were like, "Oh, I guess Emily Blunt." And they were like, "You know, just funny." Everyone was just kind of like talking, having a good time. Um, and this was like eleven ten, you know. And my dad turns to me, he's like, "I'm good." You know, and you know, granted, he didn't went to the shop and stuff, but he had he didn't need to meet anybody else. Like he was he uh, was so jazzed to, to meet Mark Wade. Um, and then you know, we went around, bought a bunch of stuff, uh, and then that's where we kind of saw Chris later, right before that. So you guys, your day was done when you well, uh, essential or his day. Was his done. day was done as soon as he met Mark Wade. Um, yeah. He bought a lot of uh, Highland Commandos. He bought a lot of Daredevil. Um, I don't think anything else he bought that was like. My, my father and you'll uh, appreciate this my father got the first issue of the because in the 60s all the popular 60s series got uh, comic book uh, adaptations by uh, gold key mm. and uh, which are getting reprinted i think right now by idw but the uh, my father got the first 1966 issue of the wild wild west Ooh. nice <laughs> too bad it's not based on the movie <laughs> yeah right yeah <laughs> uh no, anyway, the show's good. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, show me bad. But, um, it's all right. Thank God, Will Smith, but, you know. So before before uh, yeah, before yeah, I, I saw Chris, where the story will interconnect you know, kind of back to, together again. Thanks, Quentin. Um, you know, I try. <laughs> uh, I basically bought all the stuff. Like, there's this, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was, like, probably the biggest booth, and they had all these great. Was it the Victory Comics booth? It wasn't Victory Comics, but they had just the best selection of stuff. And so, obviously. It's not Third Eye? No. Uh, and it just you know I've been reading Iron Man like a motherfucker lately, and so my goal when I walked in was to get as much of Demon in a bottle as I could, and so uh, I walked in thinking I'd be lucky to get one or two because it's eight issues total. I'd be lucky to get one or two, uh, and I walked away with six of them. If I may ask, yeah, how much did it cost to get those six issues? Because you got some of the more iconic. Covers. I did. Now here's something that's really fucking cool because. Uh, especially for someone who used to work at a booth in a comic place and you want to make money. The last issue I got was 128, the famous, where it gets his title from, Demon in a Bottle. Where he's like staring in, staring the, in the mirror like, oh, fuck, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucked. <laughs> um, Leaving Las Vegas. Uh, but I mean, that issue is so fucking Whoa. good, man. Like, it's, you know, that's the, it's just, it's, it's fucking the best. Like that, that, I mean, everyone's like, oh, you know, it's the quintessential I'm a story. And it, for me, it is for a reason. Like, it's just the best. Anyway, so I got um, issue one. T- I'm, I'm missing. I'm missing issue one twenty and one twenty four. One twenty four is a bummer because I believe I'm not. If I'm not mistaken, because issue one twenty five is where he's like spy Tony Stark without the armor because his armor gets taken away because that famous moment where he actually kills the guy because his repulsor goes off and it's like one of the coolest moments um, in comics. But so one twenty and one twenty four I'm missing. I paid the most I paid was ten dollars for an issue. It was anywhere from four to ten dollars. I got issue one twenty eight for eight bucks. Here's how. I, the last place I'm going through, I'm looking through, and I see on, you know, if it's on the wall, it's expensive as shit. And I yeah. see on the wall, um, you know, 128, the, the famous issue, and it's, you know, great and stuff. And I just, for shits and giggles, I asked, I was like, how much is uh, how much is 128 there? And he's just like, oh, uh, I think it was like 40, 45 bucks, which wasn't bad, you know. Um, and I was thinking, I was seriously thinking, like, you know what? My dad, one of the few times, he's like, hey, when in Rome, you know, like. Um, yeah, your dad was throwing money around when I was money, hanging yeah, out yeah. with you guys. Um, <laughs> and uh, because he, he loaded up with cash. I didn't have as much cash so, on so me. So did my dad. I think it's a dad thing. It is very much a dad thing. Always prepared. And so I was getting ready to be like, you know what? Maybe I'll you know, get 128. I don't trust them cards. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll get 128 or whatever. And he goes, hey, just let you know, in this bin, there's a, there's a copy of 128 for like eight bucks. You know, it's, it's a little beat up. But it's not. You're not going to spend. It. I was like, F- dude. I'm. I mean, one day I'll get it all fucking fr- nice and framed because it's I, one of my. It's, it goes it's one in of the my, most iconic Iron Man stories yeah. of all time. And it, that that that'll go in my break glass of loose faith in comics thing. You know, whatever. <laughs> but I'm flipping through, and there it is. It's you know beat up edges. You know, it, it, it graded to be like two or three. But I didn't give a shit just to be holding that in my hand and be able to walk away with one twenty eight. I thought for sure. So you have you have your Pulp Fiction moment where you're sifting through and then the light shines no. through yeah it was a little bit of a dim light because it's a little beat up but i was like i don't give a shit man i was it's like, like oh. a, it's like a green light and i remember my dad it. my dad even was like looking over my shoulder because my dad oh that, my dad got like the first four issues of john carter or you know when they got released over oh. there oh um, like the marvel comic adaptation yeah yeah and so i, I the first issue there and i and i and i pull it out and even he goes oh it's demon in a bottle because like he'd hear me talking about like he's like what are you excited to get and so i was like oh shit so that was the last thing so like i said i think altogether it was like 
it, well, I got a, I got a Ghost Rider 35, which is my favorite single issue Ghost Rider. Races Death. Ghost Rider Races Death, which is fucking awesome. I got Extremis issue six, which is my favorite single issue from Extremis. Closes out the closes right out that run. Blows off the dude's head. Off the dude's head. And then kicks Damn, his and body. Then we both were like, when he kicks his body, we're like, yeah, <laughs> fucking metal. Kicks like he. Yeah. Bl- if you've never read Extremis, first off, spoilers, but sorry, it's yeah. like a fucking ten year old. It is ten years old, isn't it? Yeah, crazy. He, Iron Man two, right? Yeah, <laughs> three. he well, three, but yeah, he oh. blows off this dude's head that took like extremists before him, and then there's like a silent panel where he's just staring over his body, and then he kicks the corpse and is just like, "Damn you for, Damn making, you for me. making me do that." And then the last panel, um, I, I we had talked way back about like Team Iron Man, Team Cap, and the reason I liked Team Iron Man is, or Team Iron Man is because he's course correcting, he's trying to be a better person, he makes mistakes, he's human. Is that I, I don't I can't remember the exact quote on the top of my head, but where she's like. You know, you're no better than me or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, but I'm trying to be a better. I'm trying yeah, to be but better. At least I'm going to be able to see my look at myself in the mirror, which is the whole thing. And I was like, fuck, yes. Like yeah. in that one last shot panel, yeah. it's so fucking perfect. Because in the first issue, he's staring at himself in the mirror and he's like, don't look at me. like Yeah, that. don't look at me. like that. Yeah. And it all comes for and it's just that for me, it sums up Tony Stark so well. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, uh, and then uh, uh, that's where we meet up Chris and Charles, Charles, excuse me. <laughs> And uh, so we bought a bunch of cool shit. I was pretty much done for the day. And then we see Carl Urban. And his line's surprisingly not that long. Yeah. And his line was long on Sunday. His line, was it? I bet it was. Also, yeah. his line, it obviously, was never like Peter Capaldi level mm-hmm. or like Adam West level. Where yeah. they had to like cap off. Like oh, Peter really? Capaldi and Jenna uh, Coleman. Coleman, they had to cap off and be like, all right, at like three o'clock, they were like, Autographs are done, even yeah. though they're there for the rest of the day. Not yeah. Either, damn. Like um, no new people. Yeah, it was huge. But the. Um, Carl Urban's line wasn't wasn't necessarily obviously wasn't as long, but it was steady. Mm-hmm. There was yeah. oh, there's always there was uh, always quite a there. few. Yeah. yeah, and so we were like, let's do it. Like, and I didn't have any. I of course I didn't think I was even going to get a chance to meet Carl Urban because the way they set it up, you know, like you know VIP stuff. So I didn't bring anything to sign, and I didn't have any enough cash on me to to do anything. So I was like, you know what? I just want to go up and say hey to him. Like I want to say that I've talked to Carl Urban. Like again, we've talked to people who've. Who are going to be writing Dread? We've talked to people who have drawn Dread on this program. We've talked to people who have written Dread. Who have written? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Not just will write, but yeah. have written. Correct. And um, but we did get a bombshell of a guy that was re- going to be writing Dread. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's John Layman. <laughs> and uh, yeah, John McCray drew. And so I was like, we get to fucking meet Dread, and he had a beard on, which I thought was funny. I was mm. like, uh, that's yeah. not regulation. That's not regulation. But um. So, you know, we go online, we're doing a thing, and like, you know, it's very kind of like Adam West, very strict, you know, uh, you know, there's extra money involved. And I, if I had the money, I, I wouldn't what, care. What, what was nice was, so I think, uh, if I remember the prices correctly, it was $55 or $50 just for an autograph. Mm-hmm. And then he had like the stack of pictures that he brought with him. It and was you realize $5. how much of like nerd culture he's been in when yeah. you see all those pictures. Oh, yeah. There. Like a there was, lot. Yeah, they were like, oh, right. He was in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. yeah. Lord of the Rings. Uh, and Born Supremacy. Something and where he was a vampire. Chronicles of Reddick and... Uh, yeah. Or is he a vampire? Was it a Blade movie? He was in um, that I, I, movie, the pre, the. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, priest. Pri- is it called priest? With uh, with Paul Bettany. The priest. Right? Yeah. No. yeah. No, no, it was priest. Priest. The priest? Yeah. yeah, just priest. He was in that. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. But Still yeah. based off comic. And of course, yeah, track South Korean and, manga. Yeah. Think, yeah. Track yeah. and dread. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but so it was five dollars extra if you wanted to use one of those pictures, which I'm like, that makes sense yeah. because he, you know, the quote unquote he. Uh, probably his people uh, had to spend money to print those off. Anything and from Almost Human? I don't think so. Uh, I mean, then he again, had, I, he had I didn't watch it, so I, he had more photos. And I, I didn't see out of see Adam West and Burr and Peter Capaldi all their tables, but I'm assuming Batman and Doctor Who themes. But like, he had more f- single photos than anybody else yeah. from all the stuff he's yeah, done. Yeah, no, his he he had a he had a double wide table. Yeah, so it was like you know ten twelve feet wide, and almost all of it was, was photos. Was yeah, it was photos until it got to like his little. Uh, like four or five section foot with his section where it was just him, you know, signing. fist bumping people. Yeah, so we go through, <laughs> and like, I, I guess it's not like super awesome to just go through a line and say hi to somebody. Like, you know, they 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 do want a well oiled machine. You know, they want. Yeah. You know they're there to make money. I, I understand that totally, but like, this is one of the few times where I was like, I don't care. Like, I just want to go meet Carl Urban. And so we're going through the line. And the lady's like, you know, what do you have to sign, whatever. And we're like, hey, I just want to meet him real quick. She's like, oh, make it quick, go through, go through. And we so were like the third. Group we were the of third people group that of people. apparently just happened didn't to be. want an autograph yeah. or a picture. And I noticed that Carl Urban was fist bumping people. 
you know, I, I saw you at Germex, but I was noticing, you know, people could to shake his hands and he was like, no, fist bump. And I was like, okay. So I was like, Chris, make sure you fist bump. We can't, we can't make fun of ourselves in front of Dread. And so like we go over and like, you know, more, you know, we go fist bump and we're like, hey, I think you we were the first one to talk because we went together, of course. Yeah. And we were like, uh, there was, there was that little pause where I was like, all right, I got this. Jim. Yeah. Because I was like, uh, bu, 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 bu. Yeah. and he was Dread? like, yeah, I like Dread good. <laughs> and he was like, uh. My dad over there loved you in Bone Supremacy. <laughs> just get out. My dad always referred to him as just the new Dr. McCoy. New Dr. That's, McCoy. What, that's what he associates yeah, with. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, that's also what they were really pushing to. And um, for good Go reason. Figure. Yeah. Well, I mean, for good reason, because I guess, yeah. you know, movie stuff. Anyway, it's not like we're doing commentary for anything. <laughs> but uh, uh, some of them available now. Sam, or not Sam, Chris goes, uh, you know, hey, you know, we're all big Dreads fan, Dread fans here. And he goes, oh, yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. Um, and I, you know, I had always wanted to ask the question about like, uh, uh, did he wear like boots too tight or a piece of clothing too tight? Because Dread does in the comics. And like for for some reason, when I went up to talk to him, I was like, that is like the nerdiest goddamn question. I and I and I, I and I just wanted to go through, just do my quick bones. Maybe if I was getting some autograph, maybe. But I was just like, I just want to just talk, you know, give bones, bones. And so, um, just bone him, bone. <laughs> and the cool thing was, we're like, you know. You know, we really, we're big Dread fans. We love Dread, and he's like, "Yeah, man, we're trying, man." And he gave us like it's not like an inside scoop or anything, but you know, it's it's our. But he's like, "We're working on it, man. Like yeah. we're trying to get it signed. Yeah. Like we are working." Ma- yeah, he made it sound like he himself, like not just the rumor mill. Yeah, but from yeah, yeah. His and, and mouth, from his mouth, like yeah. no cameras, trying. nothing. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and, and you know, he'd obviously said it a lot, you know, because he had it down. But you know, he was like, "Look, like you know, we I want to play that character again." Like, yeah, it seemed we're very doing, sincere, and that was because he's a fan of Dread. Like you know, he read him when he was since he was a teenager. You know, and he was like, you know, we're trying our best. Like, you know, we're really pushing. We're, you know, we, we appreciate was, the fan support. Just keep, keep, put, to keep, keep the fan stuff going. And Chris and I were like, we were both like, you know, we're in your corner, man. Like, you know, we'll do whatever it, it takes. As if pan- we're the only ones. Packed, too. Yeah. yeah, we were like, yeah, we're in your, you're in your corner, man. We'll do it. Later on, I saw a bunch of dread cosplay, which is cool. But like, mm-hmm. um, we're like, yeah, we're. I mean, we're. You know, when when it's ready to go, we'll be there to watch it, man. Like, we're there. And he's like, oh, thanks. You know, another fist bump, and kind of walked away. And I was like, that's so cool. We met fucking dread. And then the lines for Ray Park started the form. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit, because Ray Park was next to David Prowse, and I'm like, I knock out Ray Park. Yeah. I knock out David Prowse. The two most famous Darths, man. And I fucking yeah, yeah. They, yeah. And then they had the puppeteer for um. For Akbar. Uh, for Akbar next to him, and I was like, "Did they hang out? Probably not." And um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably not. But uh, he, uh, he also did uh, uh, the father on Dinosaurs. Okay, oh, okay. Um, I saw that on his little banner. So I don't know, Sam, if you remember uh, Patrick Michael Strange. He uh, does a lot of cool stuff at the comic shop. One yeah. of the just the coolest, nicest guys around. He does, does a the, lot of uh, thing on uh, public ac- access, doesn't he? He does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the new release Wednesday stuff. Yeah. Uh, he has the Kozlov thing. He does as well. Just a really good do- dude for like. All the best things for fandom can offer. He does it. Uh, and so I saw him because he dresses up as Tunnel Rat, I think, uh, from G.I. Joe. And uh, I think it's the guy's name. And never been a big, I was never a big G.I. Joe guy. And, uh, Transformers myself. And I was more. Turtles and Ghostbusters. I was more, go. more G.I. Joe. And, Real and, Ghostbusters? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I was G.I. Joe and, and TMNT. But like, um, I saw that his group was getting, he wasn't dressed yet, but his group was getting together. Um, called the finest, which is like a big GI Joe cosplay group, and they're really you know solid stuff. Yeah, one of my friends, Maggie, is in that. Yeah, and so they were all getting ready, and I went over and said, "Hey, Patrick," I was talking to him, and he's like, "Yeah, man, we're like, you know, once Ray Park comes back from his panel, we're gonna get a photo with him." I was like, "That's fucking cool, Snake Eyes, right?" You know, everyone, of course, rightfully so, was the, you know a lot of like Darth Maul stuff and stuff, and I was there to get um, my silent interlude hardcover signed, which is a collection of the issue itself, the page breakdowns, the story, and then a. Uh, a, a, another silent issue done by Larry Hama years later about Snake Eyes, but Silent Interlude is the most famous Snake Eyes story where the entire comic is silent. There's no onomatopoeia. There's no nothing. There's just one panel where words are typed on a screen, but that's it. Everything else is silent. No word bubbles. Anything, and it's all you know, Snake Eyes. And so I was like, well, if you're gonna meet Snake Eyes, that's what you get the fucking sign, like the dude that brought him to life on screen, and did, and, and it's just the perfect Snake Eyes. And so uh, I guess he had a, a panel, so we had some time to kill. And that's when we met up with Sam uh, and Jack Stone. I remember he walked, it was so funny, he walked up and he was like, yeah. And, you know, obviously he knows us. But he walked up and he's like, Jack Stone, hey, how's it going? You know, and he's, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was so weird because Sam. My father, my father kind of carries himself like a kind of like 1950s like lounge mus- he musician. Does, he that does, just came yeah. off like, stage. He, like he still has the drink in his hand and yeah. is like a little wary. He's like, hey, Jake, hey, how's it going? It's, you fly in, lad? Yeah. Hey. It's, it's, it, it, was, it was very funny. Like technically, this is like really the first time I've ever actually met you know uh, Sam's dad, the man, the myth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, no stash. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, yeah, his uh, his uh, wife, uh, my stepmom, made him shave it off a couple of years back. Ah. <laughs> uh But anyway, so uh, I think I've seen it so, once. I've so s- Sam Sam goes, "Oh, this is my dad," and and he reaches his arm and he's like, "Jack Stone," and I'm like. Yeah. Damn yeah. glad to meet you. I know your last name is Stone. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember I introduced him to my dad because the, like, they had never met. And and because and because of that, I was like Chris Nolan, <laughs> yeah Charles. Uh, I introduced him to my dad because they had never met, and I was like, "This is my dad." And he goes, "Hello, Dad, uh, Jack Stone." Um, so you know, we kind of hung out, my old man. Yeah, we kind of hung out and and uh, and you know talked a little bit and kind of just whatever, and then. Uh, did a uh, you know uh, one two three break and then did our own thing. Yeah, we all kind of dispersed. And then a uh, bit. I was like, I'm gonna be heading back here. And then it happened, we went up with Chris again because the Ray Park line was long. I mean, yeah. they were going to go. And the thing that I loved is that when he showed up, and it's gonna sound weird, when he showed up, the line wasn't moving. Yeah. And I was like, fuck yes, because that means this dude is taking his time. Mm-hmm. And um, nothing against David Prowse because I, I met him too, and he was he was and a nice guy. His line fucking moved, and his line was longer than the Ray Park line initially. And by the time we got up there, he had got everyone through. Mm-hmm. Ray Park was, uh, and you know, a lot of times they don't like, and I don't mean this as like the celebrity people, but I think a lot of times like the handlers and stuff are like, hey, if you're doing a photo op, you're paying for the photo op, no selfies, no uh, f- uh, pictures with cell phones. Don't be standing off to the side taking yeah, yeah, pictures. Yeah. yeah, he got up multiple times and took pictures with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, he got a picture. And, of, and, he, and he was like, hey, let's get a picture. Yeah, yeah. He got up and he got a picture of him getting cut in half. Mm-hmm. Uh, by a lightsaber, <laughs> he took a picture and with he walked out and with you know the finest were all waiting there mm-hmm. and he grabbed a sword and he was like yeah yeah and as soon as he stood in front of them boom locked the snake eyes pose you know what I mean and everyone was going fucking crazy and he was just being super nice uh, and you know Chris and I were just shooting the shit yeah I had a VIP badge I could have yeah. skipped it but I preferred to sit there and watch yeah. him well I appreciate it too you kept me entertained. Yeah. Um, and so we were sitting there, me with the, the Snake Eyes book that he act, technically has nothing to do with, <laughs> and Chris with his Sleepy Hollow uh, laser disc, because I was super excited to see his reaction. I, I was like, Chris, I'm get in front of me, and I because I want to see this reaction. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it was, halfway through the line, I have that freak out moment. Yeah. I'm like, wait, he was in Sleepy Hollow, right? Yeah. I'm and not, I remember, I'm not, I'm not like, I'm misremembering. Yeah, yeah. It's like, and and. And of course, it's a convention. Yeah. And also at the the Was- the Washington Convention Center, you're underground. So I'm trying to get on to my phone onto IMDb, and like not thinking to even try their Wi-Fi because I'm used to convention centers Wi-Fi is you know being Terrible. ridiculous, either not good connection or expensive. So I'm just sitting there like, go to IMDb. Yeah. And I remember I was like. No offense, Chris, but it works out either way for me. We get a good reaction <laughs> if he wasn't in it, and we get a good reaction if he wasn't yeah, in it. So, I get to see this, and I want to see so, it happen. So ultimately, but I, I, had, I, I was like, we talked about it a lot on the commentary. Like, yeah, he's definitely. Yeah, I was like, the, I was like you, I, yeah. Even I was like, okay, with the amount that we talked about it, I must have like double checked. Yeah. Now I remember nature, I didn't or, know, yeah. and I remember I that, that's why one of these I remembered. I was like, oh shit, he was the stomach yeah. of this horse. Yeah, that's awesome. so. So I get up, I uh, you know, after like maybe maybe twenty minutes, yeah. which isn't terrible for for uh, waiting in line for an autograph. I've been to plenty of conventions; twenty minutes isn't that bad. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I get up there and I put it down, and he's like, "Oh!" And I was like, "Yes, uh, if memory I serves." Wasn't in this. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, that would have been the worst. He just kicks it to the side. Uh, but uh, I'm like, if memory serves, you were the the uh, one of the stuntmen in this, and he's like, "Oh yeah, no, I remember being in this," and I was like. Oh, thank God. <laughs> when you turn around, you're like, Jake, he was in it. It works. He was in it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so... Uh, and, 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 sweat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like, he kind of like, th- you know, uh, clearly he doesn't get recognized as being in Sleepy Hollow yeah. uh, a lot. Because for those of you that don't know, he is the headless version of the headless horseman. Uh, Christopher Walken plays the horseman himself. But uh, whenever you see him without a head doing any kinds of stunts, you know, horseback riding, he's like sword super fighting, badass in the yeah, movie. The it's best parts of him, it's Ray Park. Uh, so he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't get many, uh, or like, you know. So we we kind of like shoot the shit a little bit about laser discs, and he's like, yeah, I don't get very many laser discs, and I was like, well, yeah, that's uh, because you were actually only in like two movies, as far as you know, I'm aware that had laser discs, and uh, this uh, Sleepy Hollow is actually the final movie to be printed on uh laser disc here in america and uh episode one you could only get in japan and he was like oh yeah i uh, watched you yeah, like give of, him a yeah. lesson 
And and he was like, oh, that's neat. That that, that makes sense. You know, I thought about getting a laser disc player, but they all like you know disappeared by the time I you know got around to having money for it. I I guess that's why. And I was like, yeah, probably. I I collect them for some reason. I don't even know why. Mostly nostalgia, probably. Yeah. You know. Uh, and, and he I like, have a problem. Yeah. And he was <laughs> please like, help me. <laughs> please God help me. This is my cry for help. Yeah. But yeah, no. So he he seemed genuinely interested about it. Like, which is is a cool thing. Most of the time, uh, I you know. I'm, like I've said before, I like being the laser disc guy at conventions, and usually that does spark that like little bit of uh, conversation because so few people get laser discs to sign. So like I, you know, that, that's an icebreaker because everyone's always like, "What do I say to this celebrity?" You know, mm-hmm. "Oh, you changed my life," or this, that, and you know, like, and uh, like most of the things I'm, you know, uh, we're we're all sure that these guys have heard a million times. But me being the Laserdisc guy, I get that random thing that they're like, "Oh shit, no one remembers Laserdiscs," yeah. and I'm like, "I do." Yeah. Oh, tell him about the yeah and, the power glove. Oh yeah, and and uh, so I'm also wearing my power glove, uh, and uh, as soon as I walk up, like the first thing he does is he puts his hand out to to shake, and you know I shake with the power glove hand, and as soon as I grip it, he just goes ah like I'm crushing his hand, and it was like Yee. I don't uh. I I usually keep my cool around celebrities, but like I totally geeked out with Ray Park, and it was probably out of out of the 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 almost dozen uh, autographs that I ended up getting. Uh, that was probably the most fun for yeah, me. Yeah, he again, you know, I've had been super lucky with the people I've met, writers, artists, celebrities, all been really nice. You know, even if they're tired, they they still give you the time of day. And this by no means uh, lowers them, but like Ray Park for me is cl- is one hundred percent the nicest guy I've ever met. Like in in that industry, he took the time with every single person. Someone brought up a lot of. The cool things that people do is like if they have a statue, like a lot of Darth Maul statues, instead of bringing the statue to the con, they'll have like a platform for it. You just sign the platform. And this one kid had like Darth Maul toys and he had a, yeah. like the like a rocky kind of like platform. Mm-hmm. And Chris actually gave him the idea. I, could, I heard you say it like off kind of when you're yeah. waiting in line. He didn't want to sign the top of it because yeah, it would be yeah, chicken scratch. Yeah, he's, he sat there and like, yeah, it's very textured, very three dimensional. He's like, I don't know where to sign it, man. You know, I don't I don't I don't want to I don't want to ruin it. I don't want it to look bad you know it's just gonna look you know it's gonna look funky and uh me remembering seeing a lot of autograph signings uh because i was you know working for midtown comics or you know my own things getting autographed a lot of times when people bring statues with bases they'll they'll sign the bottom because that's a flat surface and and what ray park ended up doing was he was like all right well i feel bad you know i'm gonna do that because that yeah that is you know the smartest thing to do in terms of getting a good signature but i feel bad that you won't be able to see it so I'm going to sign that bottom and then I'm going to try to find the flattest surface on the top and I'm going to try to, you know, do a little scribble right there so mm-hmm. that you can, you know, still show people without having to, you know, take it apart. And I was yeah. like, that's, yeah, that's he, cool. He, he, you know, he really looked and found the spot mm-hmm. and did a little tiny autograph on mm-hmm. the on, so you could see it and then he signed a big one on the bottom. And another cool thing with that same kid, because I want to say that kid had like four he had, bases yeah, a lot of at least. Stuff, yeah. Every single thing. He was like, oh, so what's this for? You know, and asked, yeah, he asked you know, me what the toy gen- was. Genuinely wanted to know what the toy was. And, and like, and asked him, like, just little things like he asked what marker. He's like, do you want the yeah. silver one? Do you want the gold mm-hmm. one? Do you want a black one? Do you oh, want yeah. a red I lo- one? I love it when they, you know, um, you know take and, into consideration. You know, and the kid was kind of like, Oh, you know, he was like very shy, like uh, like first. Signing, and he kept like, he kept like going did. like hey, shake your baby's hand, first kid. signing. Yeah, baby's <laughs> like, he kept like shaking the kid's hand, and then he was like fist bump, buddy. And he was like ah, and then when he went to fist bump, he went yeah. like a big explosion, like back. He's like yeah, and the kid was like yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. And so um, so I'm I was next in line, and I went up, and I was just like, you know, I know I don't think I don't think I said I know you have nothing to do with this comic, but I was just like this is the greatest Snake Eyes issue of all time. He's like oh yeah, man, like this is the best. Um. And so he's like, kind of looking through it, flipping through it, and he's actually never read it before. Yeah, he's, he's like, like I, he's like, who the fuck's Snake? GI Joe's in comics. He's like, I was in Snake Eyes. Yeah, uh, no, that but, wasn't me, kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're the one that. Fucked yeah, yeah, I up, fucked up. Me. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> he's like, everybody, look at this idiot Jack over here. I'm like, it's Jack. No. My dad leaves me. You know, um, all my fucking Iron Man comics on the ground. By the way, we've kicked you off the podcast. I know this is the last one. But uh, he goes, uh, he was like, oh yeah, man, and I was like, dude, like you fucking nailed snake eyes like you know it's it's just like you brought this comic like the single issue is one of my all-time favorite issues of anything you brought this to life like with the way you move stuff like that he's like oh yeah and so he he did a cool he had you know the gold pen was like the you know, whatever and he signed the front of it which i really liked so you can see it and he drew the um the clan symbol for snake eyes on the front you know wrote yo joe jake um and then signed like you know snake eyes and signed his name and stuff and then we were kind of just talking and as he was signing i was like 
you know, I hope we get to see you play Snake Eyes again. And he was like, I'm contracted for a third film. He's like, I really want to do a third film. Um, he goes, but the problem is Dwayne just got cast as Doc Savage, which is funny. I was like, I'm talking to Snake Eyes about Doc Savage. So he's like, <laughs> he's like, we'll see. He's like, but I want to. He's like, and he got really animated. He's like, I really want to. The rumor uh, is that they're crossing it over with Transformers. Transformers, yeah. Oh, that'd be so fucking cool. Uh, <laughs> Snake Eyes is like driving fucking Ironhide. I'm like, <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, he was like, you know, I want to do it. And he's like, I really want to get then, into uh, the. And then uh, Megan Fox replaces um, uh, one of the actresses as a one. Of the, I don't know what about G.I. Joe. Yeah, yeah, Scarlet or the Baroness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Probably Scarlet, just no, because Alexis, Michael Bay has a, no idea what he's doing. It's Alexis yeah. Fidel, and I'm like, yeah. But um, just Roy Gilmore shows up. But uh, as Roy Gilmore, yeah, not not as like Baroness. And so he's kind of like flexes, and he's just like, I want to get back in that character and like explore him more. Like I want to do more Snake Eyes. And I was like, again with Carlo, I was like, dude, I'll be there. And then like as I was getting ready to turn, I was like. He was like, because I wanted, he's like, I want to focus more. Like, I want to do more Snake Eyes and like focus on that character. And I was like, I think he's like the coolest comic. He's like the perfect comic, you know, along with Wolverine and Judge Jedi. He's like, he's like the perfect comic character. And he like did this weird thing where he kind of stopped for a second. He looked at me and he did the most sincerest fist bump. He just put his hand and he was like, yes. <laughs> and he was like, so, like, I, I don't know what it was. He like, because it, the, 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 the uh, conversation was over. Yeah. You know, like, I was like, thank you, man. Like, I shook his hand like twice. And I was like, and as he gave me the book back, I was like, oh, it's so fucking cool with a gold pen. And he was just like, I was like, yeah, he's, you know, Snake has the coolest character. And he's just like, he like looked at me. He's just like, yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. And it's like, <laughs> like, it wasn't like, bam, fist bump. It was like a nice, just tender fist bump. It was, yeah, it was the, the tender, just, the tender fist bump, the, yeah. the soft rock fist bump. We just it was like, like the ballad fist bump. <laughs> Yeah. Like you know the fucking supernova, and my dad actually you just, got you that. Just, you just melded, yeah. like Avatar yeah. bonding. Yeah. 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 And my it's dad, not, actually, it's not the shouted out loud fist bump. It's the Beth. It's the Beth. Bet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the hard luck woman. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, yeah. Um, my dad actually got that. Like you know, supposed to take personal side, but he didn't give a shit. He got that like moment, like uh, with my back. I'm just like yo. And I was like, I fucking fist bump Carl Urban and fucking um, Snake Eyes. And then right next door uh, to him, because there was like no line, was was David Prowse, and yeah. I was like. God, fucking meet David Prowse, dude. So we, we, you know, went over. Chris had already met him. I actually, I, I, I went to David Prowse's booth every day of the convention. Did you really? Yeah. So first day he was there. I got my Laserdisc box set for the the tri- the original trilogy. Of course, stand. Natch, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jelly, <laughs> Lime Green Totes. Jelly, legit, um, lit. Uh, <laughs> I knew second day. Asshole. <laughs> Second day, uh, I go with you. That's Charles. That's Charles speaking. <laughs> yeah. he, he's killed me when you had the chance, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Charles Xavier, <laughs> you're, you're not. St- <laughs> you're not strong, strong enough, enough, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> and your Professor X. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, <laughs> Grind and halt, no. <laughs> <laughs> Charles. Yeah, Grind yeah. and halt, Charles. Uh, Second day, I go with Jake. Uh, for for him to get uh, hit, you know something signed for him, and then third day, um, one of my friends sends me a text and is like, "Hey, can you get uh, you know Darth Vader's signature?" And I'm like, "You I mean David Prowse, you fucking nerd?" Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was like, "All right, fine, fifty bucks," you know, because yeah. that's the price of an autograph. That's right. I'm not, yeah. I'm not being a dick. Uh, fifty bucks, little man. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, uh, I I get one of the badass um, like like arms crossed. Oh yeah, posts. yeah, yeah. Should have gotten the crossing guard guy. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, had, the green the, the green code cross man. I think it was. That's yeah. he's, he's most proud of. He teaching kids how to properly look should've, both ways and cross. Should have should have been like, That's hey, true. this is what you get for not. You should have dressed up as him, and he would have been like, come here. <laughs> um, next next year, next time, baby. But he um real quick, my favorite thing that happened with David Prowse didn't involve me at all. It was the guy in front of me um, was having him sign. Uh, funny enough, a Darth Vader comic of the Marvel series that's going on right now, which is really good. Um, I had him sign. I, th- I believe it's the number one variant. Really cool design where it's Darth Vader's face mask, and in like the grates where he breathes is a young Anakin Skywalker, like he's in prison in jail. Like this great kind of it says everything about Luke, you know, Anakin Skywalker. I was like, oh, I bet he's gonna love this, and probably not give a shit at the same time. Um, <laughs> but so the guy in front of me, he goes and puts his book down, and David Prowse signs. David Prowse is Darth Vader <laughs> on everything, and that's how you know. 
And so he signs David Prowse. I had no idea. Is Darth Vader. And as he's writing, is Darth Vader, the guy goes, yes, you are, sir. <laughs> like, he was like, so like, oh, God. He was, and, you know, David Prowse was very, he's an older guy. So he was kind of just, you know, he, I think he would talk a little bit. And again, I had this big notion. I was going to be like, oh, I love that story you tell about being able to, you know, you were the one, you were able to pick the emperor up in one take and throw him over. And it's the greatest redemption moment in all of film history. I had all this stuff. But I could just see he was just, you know, he just was there just to be nice and sign. And as long as I could shake his hand, that's all I really wanted. And so, I had him sign my thing and I was like, it's, you know, really great to meet you, sir. And uh, all the Vader stuff, you're looking around and you're trying like, like when I saw Paul McCartney live, I couldn't wrap my head around the fact that that's a Beatle that was in the same studio with the Beatles and Sir George Martin. I was trying to wrap my head around that. This was the guy that we grew up watching and is the greatest villain of all time. And, and has that redemption moment. And I could, I, 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 I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't connect that when I was watching it. The trick for me with those moments is like when I'm meeting Adam West or when I'm meeting William Shatner, it's not like you focus on the man and then when you're done, yeah, you can kind of turn to yourself and just go, I just met, I just met a Batman yeah. or I just met Captain Kirk. Yeah, yeah, that was exactly it. And so he signed the thing and I remember I was just like, thank you. So I shook his hand. His hand's fucking massive. Yeah. And I remember Bigger I was like, in my hand. I was like, this is, big hand. I was like, this is the hand that fucking holds Luke's lightsaber and Re- return of the Jedi. He's like, you constructed a new lightsaber. And I'm like, that's that hand I shook, that's, man. That's the hand that picked up the emperor. That's the hand that fucking picked up the emperor in one take. And they tried to use a pulley system. And he was like, no stunt man for me, motherfucker. I'm David Prowse. <laughs> um, and anyway, he, he looked at me and he signs it with a silver pen and he goes, make sure to shake it before you put it back in its pouch so it's dry. <laughs> and I was like, thank you, sir. And I shook his hand. And that was Amy No. Yeah. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't let me put, uh, uh, put the, the print in, my, uh, in, uh, in the, the, uh, the power glove hand because he was like, no, it'll mess up the, the yeah, He was very, he, every single person I saw, he was very much, he wanted to make sure, you know, nothing smudged, nothing was, sure. was messed over. Anyway, we talked way too much. Sam, tell us about now, Awesome Con. I mean, it was, I mean, it, it really the Friday was kind of low key. I got a, a lay of the land, so to speak. Uh, talked to Fred Van Lanty, who you'll uh, fuck it. You'll I'm not even going to pretend. You're going to see him next week. You're, you'll hear from us. Talk to him next week about his uh, book, Weird Detective, with Dark Horse Comics. Super fun interview. A very fun interview. We even got Josh laughing and talking yeah, on that one. Josh spoke on an interview. He did. He did. Um, and the he's uh, here. I, I promise. Confirm it on on <laughs> mic right now. No, no. He of course, promise he's here. Heaven forbid. But the. Uh, you know, world's greatest silent podcast. Saturday, Saturday was very much like, yes, I, I got to, you know, meet Mark Wade again. And, and, uh, and what was uh, your question for Mark Wade? Did you have one? I just, I just recommended he go to Ben's. Chubble. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. My question to my, my honest to God, my question to him was how, how is my, how you dig in my hometown so far? And he was yeah. like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's good. I, your I, hometown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, born on 6900 Avenue, Georgia Avenue and a hospital that no longer exists. But the um, Sam shut it down. Yeah, well, my sister was born there too. But the uh, and shut it down. <laughs> more likely, but the <laughs> <laughs> no uh, more babies. Yeah, can't have any more of these stones. Yeah, yeah, two is enough. But the uh, no, I mean it was, and Saturday was very, especially Saturday afternoon was very much like business day for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was I was doing these interviews in a tie. In a tie, a shirt and tie, in a shirt and tie, and wearing brainy glasses. Yeah, yeah, like like David Tennant Fucking stepped up. Yeah, um, to the streets. I was talking to scientists. I wanted to look like I, even though I didn't know that fire apparently emits ultraviolet radiation. <laughs> so you looked like um, uh, Man of Steel, Clark Kent, when you walked up. I was like, "There's, there's Sam." Yeah. Just the the Sam shuffle. I was like, "There he is." <laughs> I have a shuffle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's but like, yeah, it's like a. You have a distinct walk. Yeah, it's like uh, uh, the peanuts. Just you <laughs> shuffle your feet. That's how it is. <laughs> yeah. just, hey guys, I'm like Sam, is something wrong? You're like, no, what's up? I'm like, you're fucking like, what's happening right now? Yeah, you're floating. It's yeah. funny. We all just kind of met up at the same place. Like yeah. we didn't yeah. plan it. Like I mean, it's just you know. Yeah, and you know, Sunday, all I, me and my father set out to do was was meet Adam West and Burt Ward, mm-hmm. and you know that that went fine. He, as far as I know, he doesn't. Uh, he didn't give me a. a call you Steve. Or he, I would, did not receive a pen name, but uh, <laughs> the. Uh, <laughs> that you're, means lost. you're not as good. Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I'm not suddenly Scott Stone or or <laughs> like Scott Stone has yeah. nice yeah. to it. Yeah, mm. I like that. My father didn't suddenly become like Javier Stone. Oh, <laughs> even better. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Jasper Stone. <laughs> but uh, Jasper Stone. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's always it's always fun. It's yeah. it's it's really the only con I go. I guess I didn't even go as a fan this year. At least, well, I did. I guess the first and the last day mm-hmm. because you bookended it as yeah. a fan. Did you pick yeah. anything up or? 
I didn't actually pick anything up. Really? Interesting. No, I didn't pick anything up. I just got some stuff signed and I, I even I picked up some dollar comics. Yeah, I, I I you know, for whatever reason I didn't pick up any any dollar books. Probably because, you know, I'm thinking about making a move soon and I probably mm. have too many comic books as mm. I have twenty two long boxes. Yeah. So that's gonna, you know, gonna be a bitch to transport. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I it's funny, when I working when I was working at the shop, I saw like future you in terms of like what you're gonna be like in terms of like <laughs> The guys who walk in and their backs are broken and they're like, <laughs> I just moved. I have 47 long boxes. Why am I still doing this? And like, they're like, still my garage. Buying, like a short box. Yeah, they're like, my garage is full of long boxes. There was a guy, I, w- I wasn't working there when this happened. There was a guy who, I think he was just DC or was just Marvel. Let's say Marvel just for shits and gigs. Um, shizzles and gizzles. Shizzles and giggles, my nizzles. And it was, uh, he bought, he was signed up for every single Marvel comic. Yeah. So when e- like Jeff Loeb. he got every single Marvel book when it came out, and he never he didn't read any of them. Oh. His plan was that when he retired, he had stuff to read for the rest of his life. That's kind of kind of cool. So he had like hundreds and hundreds of books that he'd buy every. He'd have like basically a long box every week, almost of stuff. Damn. Um, so. I did set the high score on the because there was a free arcade this year. Nice. I did set the high score for Asteroids. Yeah, I remember Bones. you were talking about yeah. that. So, that was pretty. Sweet. That was pretty cool. That was a se- that was an authentic cabinet from 1978 too. Yeah. Yeah, nice. so. For today, can we just call it Snake Eyes and we Bones just for the sure. rest of the day? Snake yeah, Snake Eyes. Snake, snake Eyes. Snake Eyes. It's like communion, or like when you're like, uh, <laughs> yeah. and also with you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before we sign off, um, Josh, you saw the Nice Guys. What do you think of it? <laughs> Just I so we make sure you got something on record. Yeah, you oh, are yeah. you are yes. here. Yeah. Might as well utilize well, in, in you. As the yeah. one who yeah. didn't go to Austin. Good night, Eric Con. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, no, I thoroughly enjoyed the film. And I think there should be more movies in the universe that are that goddamn enjoyable. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a crowd pleaser. Yeah, I mean, and I, I agree with your sentiment, Sam, that it is what Inherit Vice should have oh, yeah. been in oh, terms yeah. of enjoyment, uh, comedy... Um, have you I seen s- Have you seen Kiss Kiss Bang Bang? Oh God, yes. Okay, I was gonna say if you hadn't, then fucking <laughs> I, I, see that. I fucking own it. Yeah, I, I love yeah. That still movie. have yet to see it. Oh, dude. We will it's, fix that. It's so good. But it's like um, I'm pretty sure winner. all three of you have promised to do that. That's right. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually own it. I, I was surprised <laughs> that uh, Matt Bomer was in the film. Yeah, That's right. you know when yeah. I saw him in the credits roll in the beginning, I was like, yes, sweet, he's getting more work. And then halfway through the film, I'm like, I'm not seeing him. <laughs> oh no, they've just named a. Bad guy I haven't seen yet. Oh, fuck. There he is. <laughs> he's, he's got some badass shit. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, but I just... I, I Don't get me wrong. I love seeing him play, like, bad guy, but not, like, full-on bad guy. Oh, I, yeah. I look he's like good. questionable bad guy or <laughs> kind of bad guy, kind of good guy. Not, like, full-on... Pitch black. Like, yeah. Yeah. Murder everybody yeah. bad guy. Oh. Yeah. Well. yeah. When you gotta kill, absolutely, absolutely have to kill every single motherfucker in the room except no, no substitutes. substitutes. Um, Good scene. It's, it's, uh, you haven't seen that. It's Jackie Brown. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the, uh, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> you weren't here when we watched. It? Oh wait, no, that's right. We it. didn't end up watching it. Yeah. 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 yeah I, that I was just forced myself to finish it because it was leaving Netflix. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, again, Outrageous Acts of Science is going to be on uh, the Science Channel. comes back for its sixth season on uh, June 22nd at 9 o'clock. And you can catch Kyle Hill on, uh, you know, uh, again, he's the science editor for uh, Nerdist Science. Uh, you know, he's the uh, host of Because Science on uh, on YouTube. And, yeah, he's, his program uh, on how to build everything, that airs, uh, you know, in the 30-minute block after Outrageous Acts of Science. So, you know. A lot of science going on, and it, again, it is cool to kind of break up the pop culture monotony and and get educated every now and That's again. Right. So yeah, definitely, uh, th- and that was a lot of fun. Thanks again to the Science Channel and all those scientists for making that making that happen. So uh, yeah, this has been another installment of Catching Up. This concludes our hundredth episode I- celebration. We'll be back with an honest to god episode one hundred and one next week. And uh, I'm Sam. I'm Charles. I'm Jake. I'm Josh. Bye. <laughs> We already said it, man. You want to say it one episode, dude. Fine, whatever. I ain't doubling that shit. <laughs> this has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a new commentary every Monday. We've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening. <laughs>